Hi there, welcome to this special edition of NAT5 Applications Supported Study. So today we're going to go through a few of the key questions that you might come across in any National 5 Applications exam. So specifically for my class, I have added in to your Teams page <clears throat> under the National 5 Applications Revision Channel some additional notes and revision textbooks so you can have a little look there in addition to watching this video if there's anything at all you want to check out prior to the exam as well as that there are also past paper topic by topic documents in the same channel so if you go in there it works very similar to the national five maths topic by topic revision papers that I put on a while ago. So if you use those and you search up what topic you want to work on, um, there's a series of questions just for that particular topic. And then you can see there is also marking schemes for both paper one and paper two. So remember paper one is non-calculator questions and paper two is calculator questions. So as I said, I'm just going to work through a few questions that we might come across and then the rest of the questions are posted on Teams so you can work through them at your own time and the solutions are also available. So as we work through these questions, it might be useful for you to pause the video, read the question and try it for yourself. And then if you restart it, you can then watch me going through the solution, which would be quite a good way to practice and make sure you know what you're doing. So, as I say, I've picked a few topics, not absolutely everything, and it's impossible to go through everything in a short space of time like this. So, I'll just limit the video to maybe 20 minutes or so, and we'll just do what we can do in that time. So, the first topic that I've picked to look at is working with time zones. So, I've got a past paper to do with time zones here. So, Lucy is a sports journalist. She travelled to Doha to report on the international athletics event. She flew from Manchester to Doha, so I'm going to highlight that information. Her flight landed in Doha at 19.18 local time. So that means that it is 19.18 in Doha. Her flying time was around seven hours and 23 minutes. And another key bit of information is that Doha is ahead of Manchester. So we used to calculate the local time the flight left Manchester. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my working space almost like a map of the world. So I know that Manchester is in the UK over here and Doha is somewhere over here. So I'm going to have two columns. So I'm going to start off in Doha. Um, and because that's what I know information about, I don't know anything about Manchester at the moment. And I know that the flight landed in Doha at 1918 local time. So I'm going to write that in underneath Doha. However, that was after we already flew for 7 hours and 23 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to then work backwards and I'm going to work out what time we actually left Doha. So I'm going to put underneath Doha again the flight takeoff time. And I'm going to work backwards from 1918 and I'm going to work back and get what time the flight took off. So the flying time is 7 hours and 23 minutes. So I'm going to start off by taking away 7 hours. So that's going to get me back to 12.18. And then I've still got a remaining 23 minutes to take off. So I'm going to start off by taking off 18 minutes to get me back to 12. But I've still got a remaining... Oops, sorry. I've still got a remaining five minutes to take off to total 23. So that's going to take me to 11.55. So 
So that means that the flight took off at 11.55. Okay, so I've used um, that bit of information and I've used that bit of information. And the next thing that I've got is that the flight, eh, sorry, that Doha is two hours ahead of Manchester. So whatever time it is in Manchester, then it's two hours ahead in Doha. So if it was 7pm in Manchester, it would be 9pm in Doha. Um, I've just realised I spell it wrong. So um, at the moment, I have got the landing time and the takeoff time as both Doha times. So we definitely took off in Doha. Eh, sorry, we definitely took off in Manchester and we landed in Doha. But at the moment, it looks like I've taken off in Doha, flew around and then landed back in Doha again. So what I want to do now is I want to take away the two hours from 11.55 and make myself, uh, make my way back over to the UK and find out what time that takeoff time was local to Manchester. So that means I'm doing 11.55 and I'm going the opposite way, so I'm going backwards to Manchester. So I'm going to take off two hours to get back to Manchester, which is going to take me to 09.55. So the time that the flight left Manchester was 09.55. It then flew for the 7 hours and 23 minutes, plus a difference of two hours, and it landed at 19.18. Okay, so the next um, topic that I'm going to have a little look at is probability and I've picked a couple of common looking questions to do with probability. So this one is picking out some information from a table and expressing it as a probability. So remember that is the likelihood or chance of something happening. So the question is, Mrs Abid took a survey in maths, in her maths class, sorry, of how pupils travel to school. The results are shown below. So we can see that um, six boys chose walking, four chose cycling, and three chose to take the bus. So there was 13 boys in the class in total. Two girls walked, three girls cycled, and 12 took the bus. So there were 17 girls in total. So then what I can do is actually, just while I'm here, is just work out that altogether there must have been 30 pupils in that class. What is the probability that a pupil chosen at random as a girl who cycles to school? So I want to go to the table, go to the where it says girls, go to where it says cycles, and I can see that that would be three. Now there's a little hint of how we're going to write this probability because it actually um, states that we have to write it in its simplest form. So that's indicating that probability should be written as a fraction of the whole chance so of it happening. So the probability of a girl who cycles would be a 3 in 30 chance. And then I'm going to simplify that by dividing both the top and bottom by 3 because that would be my common factor and that would simplify to 1 tenth. So the probability that proof we chosen at random is 1 tenth. And that's the final answer. Now, just be aware that you could also ask for a probability to be in a decimal format. So we've got to be able to convert fractions into decimals. So a good way to be able to do that is to divide the top of the fraction by the bottom. So we say 10 into 1 doesn't go. So we're going to put down our decimal and carry over the 1. And then 10 into 10 would be 1. So the equivalent decimal to 1 tenth would be 0.1. We may also get asked to write it as a percentage, in which case we want to remember that percentage is out of 100. So we're going to times 0 0.1 by 100 and we get 10%. So there's three different ways that we could write that probability and they're all equal to one another. So we just have to watch and see what way the question is asking. Okay, here's another probability example. So this time we've got Anisha and Brian are playing a board game. Each move is determined by two rolling, or sorry, rolling two dice. Anisha requires a total of 10 or more on her next roll to win the game. So there's different ways we could make 10. What is the probability, though, of all the different options that we could have 
um, of her winning the game. So we need to know how many different ways we could win by getting 10 or more. So we know the maximum we could score would be 12. So any combination that would give us 10, 11 or 12 would give us a win. But we know there's lots of other combinations. So we need to know all the combinations so we can write that fraction, remember. Okay, so the probability of a win has to be written as a fraction. So we need to know all the different probabilities as well as how many different options there are for getting 10 or more. So a key way to do that in National 5 applications is actually to create a little table. And it works really similar to um, a multiplication table that you might have encountered previously at primary school. So what we do is we set this sort of T-bar table up and we're going to be adding the scores together. So although we've maybe used this strategy before for a multiplication grid, when we set it up this time, we're going to be adding the two sides of the dice together. So we know that on one dice, we've got sides one to six. And on the other dice, we've also got one to six. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this table just to record all the different possibilities that we could have. And also at the same time, record the total scores from that combination so we could roll our dice and we could roll double one we could roll one on one dice and one on the other and the total would be two we could roll the dice again and we could score two on one dice and one on the other so in total that would give us three and three and one four and one five and one and six and one and so on potentially we could then score two on the other dice and one on that dice so all together that would make three we could score a 2 and a 2, we could roll a 2 and a 3, a 4 and a 2, and so on. And then we keep going, so we could score, sorry, roll a 3 and a 1, we could roll a 3 and a 2, a 3 and a 3, a 3 and a 4, a 3 and a 5, and a 3 and a 6, and so on. So you can start to see there's a, like a little pattern emerging as well. So you can then just be a little bit more quick about filling this table in. So this has given us all the different probabilities as well as the all the different combinations to get those probabilities to get those sorry to get those totals and it means that it's in a nice organized format and you're not going to miss anything or forget any different combination or any total there we go so we can see that actually in total there are going to be 36 different combinations the combination that we need though is remember to get us a winning um or to get us a win is 10 or more so i'm going to now select any combination that gives me 10 or more so actually those six different ways there would give me a win so to get a win i've got a chance of six and 36 to get a win and we'll write that in its simplest form so that would be a six so there'll be a 1 in 6 chance of winning on my next score. Okay, the next topic I'm going to have a quick look at is pro, eh, sorry, volume. So volume is also a National 5 maths question. So we should be a bit more confident with this topic. So Lorna has purchased a paperweight as a gift. The paperweight is made in the shape of a cube with a hemisphere on top. So I've got two shapes to worry about, a cube and a hemisphere. Now in the National 5 Applications exam, you do not get the volume formula for a cube and you don't get the volume formula for the hemisphere. However, you should remember the volume of a cube is length times breadth times height or just length cubed. And the volume of a hemisphere we don't have, but we do have the volume of a sphere. So the volume of a sphere is... And this is on the formula sheet. So if you had a full sphere, that volume would be four thirds pi r cubed. However, we have got a hemisphere. So we've only got half of that. So rather than four thirds, we're only going to have two thirds for the hemisphere. So I've highlighted those two words because I'm going to need to have those two formulae written down. Okay, the hemisphere is half a sphere. And it tells us we've got a diameter of 6. So that means that, that diameter of the hemisphere when across that cube there to there is 6 centimetres. 
Okay, calculate the volume of the paper weight. So I'm going to break it up into two shapes. So I'm going to think about the volume of the cube and the volume of the hemisphere. So the volume of the cube is volume one, and that is length times breadth times height. But of course, because it's a cube, we're times in sorry, we're times in the six by itself three times. Okay, so we're going six times six times six, or six cubed, to give us an answer of two hundred and sixteen centimetres cubed. And then we'll have a look at the hemisphere. So we know already because we've, we've chatted about this that the hemisphere is half of a sphere. So that would be two thirds times pi times the radius cubed. So we've got to pay attention here and we're looking only for the radius, which is just half of the diameter. So that would only be three. Now just watch as well when we are using the volume formula for a sphere, for a hemisphere, we are cubing that radius. Okay, so we've got two lots of pi times the radius cubed. And then we're saying that we're going to divide that by three though. So that's going to give us in total a volume of 56.5 centimetres cubed. So in the end, the volume of the paperweight is going to be the 216 plus the 56.5 to give us a total of 272.5 centimetres cubed. And there's no um, expectation, no doubt, in terms of rounding. So we can round it uh, correctly. Um, I've done it to one decimal place and I've also remembered to put the units in. Okay, right, let's have a little look. I'm just going to scroll down and have a little look at some other questions that are quite important. They're all important, but um, this is a really common one. So, um, fractions. So, the crowd at a rugby match was made up of home supporters, away supporters and people who were neutral. Three-sevenths were home, two-fifths were away and the remaining were neutral. So if we're thinking about a fraction of a whole, so so far I've got the whole amount of supporters um, in some respect. However, I've got three-sevenths of them. So three-sevenths of this section here were home supporters. Two-fifths were away supporters. And then another amount to make up the full amount were neutral. But we don't know that, but it's going to make up that one whole so what I need to know is what fraction have I got in total altogether so far with the home and away supporters, which is tricky because I've got three sevenths and two fifths. So what I need to do is I need to add those two fractions together to get my total, but I need to make sure I've got a common denominator first. So I'm going to multiply the seven by five and I'll do the same with the numerator. And I'm going to multiply the seven by five and I'm going to do the same with the numerator. So all together, I'm going to have 29 out of 35. So that fraction is for the home and away supporters. But then it says what fraction of the crowd are neutral. So neutral is just going to be what's left over. So if so far I've got 29 thirty-fifths, what's left over out of the whole. So I've got one whole and I'm taking away 29 thirty-fifths to work out what's left out of that whole. So what you can do is you can express the 1 as 35 out of 35 because that's one whole, one full amount, and subtract your 29, and then that's going to leave you with 6 over 35 for neutral. Okay, and then can't simplify that any further. All right then. Um, the next thing, just to have a little quick look at, was a little bit of statistics. So someone is asking me about this today, actually. So just as a little reminder, we've not done this for a while, um, how to calculate the median. So the median, remember, is a middle number in the list. It's a way to describe the average of the list. However, we need to make sure that we have got an ordered list. So we need to reorder this list of um, records from Dave. So we need to look for the smallest number. So if we look along, I think it's 37. Right, so we'll go with 37. And then the next one after that, so anything else in the 30s, we've got another 37. And then we've got a 39. And then I think after that, I think we're in the 40s, so we're looking for, so there's 42, 41, so it'll be 41, 42. 
Um, there are two forty fours. Um, a forty six. Two forty sevens. Forty eight. Forty nine. 51 and a 54. There you are. So I've now got an ordered list and I can pick out the median. Okay, so I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I know I've got the right amount. So half in that list would mean that I'd have seven numbers on each side. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Five, six, seven on one side and seven on the other, and that's going to half that list there. So the median is the number that lies in between 44 and 46. So that is quartile two or the median, and that number would be 45. So now what I've done is I've split the list into two halves. What I want to do now is I want to look at the quartiles. So I'm going to now split the list into four. So I'm going to take that bottom seven. And I'm going to split that into two equal parts. So the middle number here, or quartile 1, would be 41, which is the lower quartile. And then likewise, at the top end, quartile 3, or the upper quartile, would be 48. Once we've got that information, we, we, they, we then want to look at constructing a box plot. Now, a box plot involves five key pieces of information. Those three plus the lowest number, which is 37, and the highest number in the list, which for us is 54. Okay, so we want to use a ruler for this. So we first of all want to plot on the lowest number, which is 37. And remember, we want this to be floating, so just up above the axis. And then the highest number is 54. So again, that's going to be floating there. And then we want to put in the quartiles. So this is the, the quartiles are the parts that are going to construct the box as such. So it's the middle um, amount. So we're going to do quartile one is 41. So I'm going to make this bit a bit bigger. And that line is going to encompass the lower half of the box. And then the upper half of the box is going to be at 48. It should be in there. And the median is at 45. So then what I want to do is I want to join up the sides of my box. And I'm also going to join up from the middle of the box to the lower and the upper uh, values with two lines. And they're called the whiskers. So that's my box plot. I'm just going to mark on, just make it nice and clear. So that lower number is, in fact, 37. I've got the higher number here, which is 54. I've got quartile 3, which is 48. Quartile 2, which is 45. And quartile 1, which is 41. Calculate the interquartile range. So what we need to remember is that the range is how spread out the values are, and that would be the highest taking the lowest. The interquartile range does not include the highest and the lowest, but it includes the middle 75% of the list. And the reason for that, and what you can see here, is that actually the lower number and the higher number can often misrepresent the majority of the data and they can be outliers. So what we use is we use Q3 minus Q1. And we just take account of that middle 75% of data, which would be 48 minus 41. So the interquartile range would actually only be 7. Okay, so I'm just having a little look at something else I might want to do. Yep, so let's have a little quick look at this one. So this topic here, in case you want to do some more practice, is indirect proportion. So this means that as one thing increases, the other thing that is uh, so as a result of it would decrease. So as something increases, the result would then be the other thing decreases. So a company uh, sorry offers to fit the floor of a kitchen. They tell the Murphys that it would take three men four hours to complete. 
we want to know how long it would take two men. So if we've only got two men to complete the job, it's definitely going to take us longer than four hours. So what we want to do is we want to find out, well, how long would it take one man to lay the floor? So one man would be take three times as long. So we would say that would take three times as long. So that would actually take us 12 hours. However, we've got actually an extra man. So we're going to take that time and we're going to be able to divide it into two workers. So we then take 12 divided by two and we then find that that would take two men six hours. So it is longer than three men, not as long as one man. So we need to make sure it makes sense. So if we reduce... If we reduce the amount of men, then the time that it takes is going to go up. Okay, so if the men go down, then the time goes up. Okay, um, what other one would be quite useful? What about ratio? We've not done that for a while. So if you want to go away and practice some ratio questions, there are lots of different things that could be asked. So... Paula, Claire and Eva are paid on depending on how many leaflets they hand out. They hand them out in the ratio of 3 to 5 to 7. So Paula, Claire and Eva in the ratio 3 to 5 to 7. So in total, the amount of parts within that ratio would be 15 parts in total. Claire, it tells us, she receives £135. So Claire has got five parts in the ratio and she receives for five parts £135. But what we want to know is how much do they actually make all together? So all together there's 15 parts. And if we know that five parts is 135 then to get to 15 parts, we're just going to times that value by 3. So we do 135 times 3, which in the end comes to £405. Um, so there are various other questions. Um, you should hopefully remember us looking at tolerance. Um, so there's a question on tolerance from the slides that are on Teams, but the work solution's there. There's one converting fractions, decimals and percentages. Again, the work solution is there. Um, I think we did that one in class. Um, another one that you might need a little bit extra explanation is this one, although the work solution is there. So this is how we calculate national insurance. So national insurance is a payment that comes off our gross pay and goes to the government before we earn our net pay. So Sarah earns £51,800. However, her national insurance comp contribution has to be calculated. So we're using this table here. So what we're going to do is we're going to split it into three parts because if anyone earns only up to £8,060, they actually pay nothing. So that means for the first £8,060 that... Um, Sarah earns she's going to pay 0% on that so actually that's just going to work out as 0 so for that particular section and amount of money she's paying nothing um, but she gets paid more than that so we actually then need to consider how much tax she would pay on anything between 42,380 and 8,060 so we need to work out what that difference is to see how much money we would pay 12% on. So we're going to take away 8,060 from 42,380. So that comes to 34,320. So she's actually going to pay 12% on 34,320 pounds of that 51,500. So that comes to, let's just have a little look, that comes to £4,118.40. However, she actually earns even more than that because she earns over 
42,380. So we need to work out how much over that. So we need to say, right, well, the little bit that's left over is 51,800. Take away that 42,380. which is £9,420. So of that wee remaining amount, she actually has to pay only 2% tax on that, according to the table. So we're going to take 2% of that, which comes to £188.40. So what you can do, just to make sure you don't make a mistake here, is just add up the three totals that you're finding the percentage of, so those three there, and if we add up 8,060, 34,320, and 9,420, we should find that that totals her salary, and if it doesn't, we know we've then made a mistake. So we can check that those little bits that we've divided up our salary into are correct before we go any further. So that does total 51,800. So that's good. Um, and then from there, we can then say, right, well, the next thing we need to do is work out her total um, payment, which would be zero for that first little bit, £4,118.40 and £188.40. So let's just go ahead and add those together. And that comes to £4,306.80. So her total payment, I'll just take these bits out and put it down here. So therefore, the total payment would just be those yellow amounts added together, which would give us £4,306.80. Okay, so that's that one. So there are a few others, but like I said, they are on Teams and the solutions are there. So you can go and have a little look at them now. Um, and then if there's anyone that jumps out of you, uh, you as something additional that you need to go and practice, then remember you can use those extra team uh, questions on Teams and find those particular topics and just do a little bit extra studying for them. So I hope you found that helpful. If there's anything else you want to ask, please just get in touch over Teams and I'll do my best to try and get back to you and help you. Thank you.